decades of sailors trying to reach India and thousands of lives and dozens of vessels lost in shipwrecks, Vasco da Gama was the first Portuguese explorer who finally managed to reach the subcontinent by sea. His initial voyage to India was the first to link Europe and Asia by an oceanic route connecting the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans and therefore the East and the West. This event is considered a milestone in world history as it marked the beginning of a sea-based phase of global multiculturalism. De Gama's discovery of the sea route to India opened the way for an age of global imperialism and enabled the Portuguese to establish a long-lasting colonial empire in Asia. When Vasco de Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope, the Muslims had by then for years been the unquestionable masters of Asian trade and their long-established trade routes bound the Muslim world and the Far East in a web of mutually profitable and largely peaceful commerce. The export-import trade of Sri Lanka was in their hands and they were seen not only in the island's seaports but had sent caravans to buy and sell to all the nooks and corners of Sri Lanka's interior. Eduardo Barbosa, a Portuguese captain, describes vividly the flourishing condition of Sri Lanka. He speaks of that grandest and most lovely island which the Moors of Arabia, Persia and Syria call Zelam, but the Indians Tenarism or the Land of Delights. Its ports were crowded with Moors who monopolized commerce. Its inhabitants, whose complexions were fair and their stature robust and stately, were altogether devoted to pleasure and indifferent to arms. He speaks of their heads covered with the finest handkerchiefs, of their earrings so heavy with jewels that they hang down to their shoulders, of the upper parts of their bodies exposed but the lower portions enveloped in silks and rich cloths, secured by an embroidered girdle. He describes their language as a mixture of Arabic and Malabar and states that numbers of their co-religionists from the Indian coast resorted constantly to Ceylon and established themselves there as traders, attracted by the delights of the climate and the luxury and abundance of the island but above all by the unlimited freedom which they enjoyed under its government. The duration of life was longer in Ceylon than in any country of India. It is clear that at this time there were scattered communities of Moors wielding influence in their place of residence. They had won the confidence of the rulers who were beholden to them in many ways. They supplied the court and the nobles with foreign luxuries and gave the best price for the country's produce, while the custom duty they paid enriched the treasury. Hence, they were given considerable independence in the management of their own affairs. It was seen that disputes which rose in the ports regarding shipping and maritime commerce were settled by their own tribunal. Similarly, the Moors followed their own laws regarding marriage and inheritance. Despite the free hand they had in the management of their own affairs, they never cherished political ambitions. The Muslim merchants had obtained from the Sinhala rulers a very important privilege to be tried by their own laws. If in any of the ports where they were engaged in trade, a dispute arose in which a Muslim merchant, marina or vessel was involved, it had to be settled without delay or expense by a tribunal consisting of Muslim priests. Father Kiros, who also shared his countrymen's intense dislike for the Muslims' complaints, they entered Ceylon by trade and by money and they multiplied there to such an extent both by generation and continuation of commerce, for there came 500 to 600 each year, 
that not only in the maritime ports but even inland there were already villages of them in all the Bisawas. In the ports of Matara there were many. From Sabaragamua to Kalutara within a distance of four leagues there was a village belonging to Manuel di Milo, altogether peopled by Moors and already they used to call it the village of the Moors and there was a Cassis or a Muslim divine to teach them. One league before Aluthgama, there was a large village of Babirim or Belwala, which deserves to be called Babari for it was altogether peopled by them. This map of Colombo drawn by the Portuguese contains these words by Gaspar Correa who wrote Legends of India. The Portuguese were driven by force of storm to make a landfall in Ceylon. Refitting their ships in the harbour of Gaul, they set out to discover Kolantota, which they named Colombo. The flotilla of eight ships anchored in this bay on the 15th of November 1505. Beyond a rummage of masts and spars of smaller shipping, Lorenco de Almeida, the commander of the expedition, saw off the shore, marched by a crescent of sand, clusters of huts hidden by foliage, some Kajan godowns, and two lime-washed mosques. The latter had been erected by the brave Arab navigators whose frail craft had for centuries earlier been the carriers of merchandise to this port. The fort erected circa 1518 is shown in vignette. This is the earliest map of the Colombo destined to be one of the greatest sea junctions of the world. On the site that greeted the Portuguese when they sailed into Colombo, Paul E. Pires writes, Prominent among them rose the white walls of two mosques, standing out clear from the background of green. Access to the spices of Sri Lanka boosted the economy of the Portuguese empire. The main spices at first obtained from Southeast Asia were pepper and cinnamon, but soon included other products which were all new to Europe. In Sri Lanka, the Portuguese found that the only obstacle to their achieving control of the profitable cinnamon trade was the presence of the Muslims, since the rest of the people played no major part in the export trade. Having ruthlessly destroyed the Muslim monopoly of trade, the Portuguese enforced strict control of trade geared solely for their benefit. Thus, cinnamon was declared a monopoly of the crown of Portugal and the effect of this policy on Muslim trade was ruinous. Soon after their arrival, the Portuguese obtained permission from the Sinhalese king to establish a trading post in Colombo. The governor of the Portuguese settlement in India sent Lopo de Brito to take up position as captain of Colombo. Along with a number of workmen, he was told to build a stronger fort in Colombo, not just to strengthen their position against the Sinhalese, but also to put down the competition in trade created by the Moors.